evening. Uh, my name is Lauren Marshall and I am the Museum Director at the Merchant Adventurers Hall in York. I'd like to thank you for logging in for the talk this evening. Uh, the Merchant Adventurers Hall is a medieval guild hall built in 1357 and is still owned and run by the organisation that built it seven centuries ago. The hall is a Grade 1 listed scheduled ancient monument and an accredited museum. Apart from the stunning architecture on display, the hall houses significant collections of silver, furniture and artwork. It would be remiss of me before I start my presentation to not thank Bloomberg Philanthropies and in particular Art UK. Art UK brings together over 3,400 organisations via their website showcasing art to a global audience. Many of the organisations including the Hall, a small independent museums and art galleries, many of whom do not have the capacity or the funds to promote their collections online. We have collaborated with Art UK for several years now, and through their work, we've enhanced our collections knowledge, expanded our network, we have museum friends all over the country, and attracted new audiences to the Hall. Therefore, we are delighted to be taking part in Art Unlocked. Our focus this evening is the artwork on display at the hall and how I will attempt to tell the history of York in six paintings. I should make it clear that this is not the full history, uh, not even a fraction of the wealth of stories that I could share on York, but more an abridged version, picking out tidbits here and there. So I shall be turning a blind eye on Eber Arkham and Jorvik and even on the 21st century and concentrating on the history of York from when the hall was built in the 14th century to the 20th century. I will also endeavour to talk a little about the artists of the six main paintings featured. So we turn our attention to the 14th century and I would like to set a scene. For those of you who have visited York before, imagine a busy summer's day, but replace tourists with merchants, sailors and local people. It was a lively, bustling city full of sights, sounds and smells. York during this time was seen as the second city after London, and it was clearly a place where you could make and spend money. It was an incredibly important inland port. The River Ouse flowed out into the River Humber and then across the North Sea to the port cities of Northern Europe. The river would have been packed with vessels unloading and loading goods from the States. Wool and woolen cloth were the main exports, while goods being brought in were many and varied and came from across Europe and further afield. I have a bit of a list, which includes oil, iron, dried fruit, kettles, syrup, flax, hemp, games tables, fish oil, mirrors, felt hats, cauldrons, linen cloth, pepper, ginger, cloves, mace, almonds, squirrel skins, bitumen, paper, and of course wine. And this is by no means a complete list. Um, it it would, was not unusual to have seen a lemon in a market in York, which when you think how you'd get a lemon to York now is no mean feat. In this bird's eye view of York from the mid 19th century, you can see how York was built around its two rivers. You will also notice that in a city of six bridges today, only two had been built when this print was created. Scarborough Bridge, which was built in 1845, which is the one to the left with the railway, uh, with the railway line going over it. And in the centre of the view, a much older bridge, which with origins dating back 2000 years, Earl Dews Bridge, which brings us to our first painting, Earl Dews Bridge by Joseph Farrington. The origins of the bridge were likely to date back to the Roman period, but the bridge you see in the painting was a Tudor version modelled on an earlier medieval bridge. With the exception of two chain ferries, this was the only way across the river until the mid 19th century. The bridge was crowded with buildings, included housing, shops, a council chamber, a jail and a chapel. It also housed the first public toilets in Yorkshire, uh, which were open to the public in 1367. I imagine that these were vastly different from the public toilets today and would have almost certainly involved a long drop to the river ooze below. Various merchants had homes and rooms on the bridge so that they could keep a careful eye on the trade taking place on the staves below. The chapel was said to have been built on the site of a miracle and dedicated to St William of York. In 1154, there were so many people on the bridge 
welcoming, welcoming him home that it collapsed. He fell to his knees and prayed for a miracle that no one would be hurt. Everyone was spared. Another version was washed away during flooding with the last version, which is pictured, built in 1566. In 1724, the author Daniel Defoe de described the bridge as vastly strong and has one arch, which they tell me was near 70 feet in diameter. It is, without exception, the greatest in England. Some say it's as large as the Rialto at Venice, though I think not. Some 50 years later, Joseph Farrington's painting of Earl Dew's Bridge was exhibited at the Royal Academy in 1784, where Farrington was told that he might leave this picture as his monument. Although bright and lively, he captured a much quieter trading scene and the bridge towards the end of its life. No longer fit for modern day use, it was demolished in 1810 and replaced with a newer, if somewhat featureless, bridge in 1821. The artist Joseph Farrington was born in 1747 and was known as a landscape painter and diarist. After spending some time in the United States, he returned to London and Welsh landscape painter Richard Wilson was his tutor uh, from 1763. Farrington joined the Royal Academy when it was founded in 1769 and exhibited nearly every year, as well as serving on several committees, including the one which would decide where artworks would be hung during exhibitions. His diary, in which he kept a daily record from 1793 until his death in 1821, provides a wealth of information on the art scene and the Royal Academy in the late 18th and early 19th century. Right, so we're now going to move on to the Tudors. The Tudor period in York brought ongoing prosperity, but with tumultuous periods of social and religious change. The dissolution of the monasteries and the pilgrimage of grace had a dire direct impact on York, as did the wars with France and Spain as trade was continuously disrupted. Despite this, the mid to late 16th century was a boom time for many of York's merchants who were growing increasingly wealthy as trade routes expanded, opening up new mercantile centres. In a bid to maintain their hold on these lucrative channels, merchants from the Mystery of Mercers, one of York's most important guilds, travelled to London to advocate for a new char royal charter, spending the equivalent of £100,000 on expenses. Their quest, luckily, uh, was successful, and in 1581, Queen Elizabeth I granted a charter which gave a monopoly to the merchants on all imported goods into the city, with the exception of salt and fish. The charter would also lead to a name change for the guild, and subsequently their hall, as from then on they would be known as the Company of Merchant Adventurers of the City of York. In this painting from 1859, the busy York Street of Pavement is depicted. Although some of the buildings are new, those on the right would have been familiar to Tudor merchants. It is also on this street in 1572 that Thomas Percy, 7th Duke of Northumberland, was beheaded, with his headless bo a bed a body buried at the now demolished St Crux Church, which is also pictured. On the left, just out of sight, was the, was the 16th century home of William Robinson, which brings us to our next painting. William Robinson, um, which this was painted by a follower of Marcus Gearhart's The Younger. Uh, William Robinson was one of the most successful merchants in Elizabethan York. He was a member of parliament, sheriff of York, and twice Lord Mayor, as well as being the governor of the Merchant Adventurers on three occasions. His influence on the company and their hall can still be seen today. William was born during the reign of King Henry VIII and spent several years as a merchant in Hamburg before settling in York. Much of his wealth came from trade in Denmark and Sweden, which he used to buy properties, orchards, and even a pub. In 1558, he joined the Company of Merchant Adventurers and would remain a member for 58 years. In 1568, he was in dispute with the Lord Mayor for refusing to buy and wear a crimson gown in his capacity as sheriff. He only relented when he was threatened with the closure of his shop and a fine of £20. He does appear to have got used to his red gown, though, as he is wearing one in his portrait. His house was a five minute walk from the hall and stood on pavement. It looked similar in appearance to another property which st still stands today, Sir Thomas Herbert's house, a fine, large, timber framed building. A fireplace that once was in his first floor par parlour can now be seen in a room at the hall, 
It shows the coat of arms of the merchant adventurers of England, as he was one of several members who were instrumental in the process of acquiring the Royal Charter. Although not painted by Marcus Gerhardt the Younger, William Robinson is contemporary with his work at the Tudor and Stuart Courts. Born around 1561 to 1562, in Belgium, he was brought to England by his father, Marcus Gerhardt the Elder, also a painter. He painted nobility and royalty, for example, um, the Ditchley portrait of Queen Elizabeth I, which is on display in the National Portrait Gallery, is his work, whilst he was often used by Queen Anne of Denmark, who is King, uh, King James I's queen. As he often worked on large scale paintings, he needed a team of assistants to complete backgrounds, and he had a large studio staffed with assistants and apprentices. It's not un unheard of to imagine that maybe it, this was painted by one of his um, assistants or apprentices. We move on to the 17th century. The 17th century was a time of war, turmoil and social upheaval and brought with it change of fortunes to York. Other local ports such as, such as Kingston upon Hull and Newcastle upon Tyne, grew and expanded whilst York's geographical position and silting up of its rivers saw Yorkshire begin to shrink. It was at this time that its importance as a social centre, however, began to grow. Many wealthy families would live in their townhouses for part of the year and took advantage of the dancing, music and feasting, which was on offer for those that could afford it. The English Civil War threw much of society into chaos and York found itself at various times at the forefront of the conflict. The city was the headquarters for the Council of the North until 1641, whilst King Charles I had spent some time in York, seeing it as his northern capital. For a short time in 1642, it became the nation's capital and would remain staunchly loyal to the royalist cause. The city would be besieged by a parliamentary force in 1644, and the royalists would be defeated at the Battle of Marston Moor, where York eventually fell. Which brings us on to the portrait that you can see of Queen Henrietta Maria, um, which was painted by a follower of Sir Anthony van Dyck. Queen Henrietta Maria was the youngest daughter of King Henry IV of France and was born in 1609 at the Palace de Louvre, now part of the world famous Louvre Museum. She married King Charles I in 1625 at the age of 15. What was slightly unusual, although not unheard of at the time, was that she married a stand-in. Claude de Lorraine stood in for the groom during the marriage ceremony, and it was another month before the bride and the actual groom spent, um, spent any time together. The marriage was unpopular in Protestant England, as the Queen was a Catholic and King Charles I was thought to have Catholic sympathies. This was one of several re reasons leading to the start of the English Civil War. The portrait is an early 18th century copy of a famous painting of the Queen by Anthony van Dyck. The painting shows a pregnant Queen cradling her abdomen with a crown on the table beside her, signifying her rank. Looking on the Art UK website, this is one of five copies of an original full length portrait, which was once on display at Warwick Castle, but is now in a private collection. The portrait, although not contemporary, was added to the Hall's collection to commemorate a visit to the Hall in 1642 by Queen Henrietta Maria, where she observed the squalid conditions of parliamentarian prisoners and gave money for their relief. During the war, the Hall was used for the detention of soldiers on both sides. Very little evidence survives from this period, apart from the initials of a prisoner carved into one of the oak posts in the Great Hall. Along with the painting, it's just a small reminder of a period of bloody battles and great social upheaval across many parts of England. We don't know who painted the copy of Queen Henry, Henrietta Maria, but what we do know is that they copied the work of the leading court painter in England. With 248 known artworks, Sir Anthony van Dyck was known for his court paintings of King Charles I and his family, as well as many 17th century nobility. He also was less known, but also painted Bible stories and scenes from Greek mythology. He dispensed with the stiff postures of Tudor and Jacobean paintings and introduced a freer style, which would go on to dominate portraiture in Britain. It also confirms that our portrait is clearly a copy, as it doesn't have that Van Dyck style or sparkle. As we move into the 18th century, York was no longer the city of national importance it had once been. 
The port, however, was still busy and new stairs were being opened to accommodate larger vessels. Perhaps best described as a market town uh, during this time, York had a thriving community of butchers, brewers, bakers, tailors, shoemakers, coopers, jewellers, silversmiths, as well as booksellers and wine merchants. The increasing prosperity also allowed for philanthropy with the establishment of York County Hospital in 1740 and the dispensary in 1788. The latter was established actually in the hall and it was funded by subscriptions of the wealthy of York where free advice, medical treatments and inoculations would be available to the poor of the city. In its first year, it treated over a thousand patients and would remain in the hall for over 20 years. It's also clear that although York no longer had the ears of the monarchy or of politicians during this time, what it lacked in influence, it made up for as a burgeoning social hub, the place to be seen for the fashionable set in the north of England. The medieval city would slowly be covered up by classical facades and replaced with assembly rooms and theatres. This print by Peter Shazero from 1766 showcased the new Georgian York with its civic buildings, including the hospital, assembly rooms and county jail. It also shows the new city house, uh, now known as the Mansion House, and that was the home of the Lord Mayor of York. The building of a new property for the Lord Mayor was necessitated when a previous Lord Mayor refused to vacate the original Mansion House. Uh, the original house also still exists and is now known as the Red House. The Mansion House is the earliest purpose-built home for a Lord Mayor still in existence and predates the Mansion House in London by about 20 years. The Lord Mayors of York in the mid-18th century would almost certainly have taken up a new pastime sweeping across the country, which brings us to the new terrace walk after Nathan Drake. One of the regular pastimes of the great and good of York uh, was to promenade, uh, to walk in your finest clothes and to see and to be seen. This fashionable pastime had arrived in the 17th century and although hit with the gentry and merchant classes, it was an opportunity for all walks of life to mingle. The promenades were often rustic in character and were often located on the edges of towns and cities where the mix of urban and rural was at its height. This mix was the backdrop to walking and opened up areas that would normally not be accessible, such as the seashore or in the case of York, the riverfront. In 1730, a promenade route was to be constructed by the River Ouse, bordered with lime and elm trees and named as a new walk. It was so popular that it was extended by nearly a mile and included a new wooden drawbridge, which would take walkers over the second of York's rivers, the River Foss. This view is a 19th century watercolour copy of a famous painting by Nathan Drake, which was painted in 1756 and is in uh, York Art Gallery. In the painting, you can see a group of well-dressed York residents promenading down a tree-lined walk while sailing ships make their way down, to the, down the river to the Staithes and Earl Dews Bridge in the background. To the right, the, the back right of the view is York Minster, and you'll also see York Debtors Prison, which is now the Castle Museum. Just two years before this scene was painted, a local newspaper, with no hint of bias, I should add, described it as thus. This terrace walk made on the banks of the River Ouse and nearly a mile long may be justly esteemed one of the most agreeable public walks in the kingdom for its great neatness, beautiful town and situation which is so advantageously seen in its prospect as to render it not unlike nor inferior to any of the views in Venice. Nathan Drake, the artist of the original oil painting, started life out as a cabinet maker, uh, apprentice to his uncle in York, he was born in Nottingham in 1728, but would spend most of his life from 1752 in York. He could turn his hand to most types of painting, including portrait and landscape, as well as the popular mid 18th century types of painting, including hunting scenes. His view of York was described as undoubtedly the most ambitious graphic representation of York produced in the middle years of the 18th century. So as we approach the Victorian period and into the 19th century, uh, York did not become highly industrialized in the same way that many other towns and cities did. And what could have led to a terminal decline was only halted due to the coming of the railways, which I will discuss a little later. The Victorian age was a period of mass contradictions where the class system was at its height 
prosperity amongst the upper and middle classes grew with social morality and respectability key, whilst poverty, disease and deprivation among the poor and working classes was rife. York was at the forefront of attempts to mitigate some of these serious issues. York-born physician Dr John Snow was a leader in the development of medical hygiene and, dis and discovered how cholera was transmitted in dirty water. While Seaburn Roundtree surveyed over 45,000 people in a hugely influential study um, on poverty in the city. This oil on wood panel view of Stone Gate, painted by Rubens Arthur Moore in 1884, shows a clean and bright view of York, which was maybe not completely accurate. Although he did leave in some realism, because if you can see just in the front of the, uh, of the view there is um, some horse manure. The scene also shows a busy shopping street, uh, which mirrored much of York at this time. Perhaps what York became best known for during this period was its thriving confectionery industry. From the mid 19th century, two families in particular would turn modest grocery businesses selling tea and cocoa into globally known names, the Roundtrees and the Terries. The Roundtree started from small family beginnings uh, to become one of the largest confectionery manufacturers in the country. They moved from central York to a purpose-built factory on the outskirts of the city, which still exists and is still operated, but by Nestle, who bought the company in 1988. In 1881, Roundtrees introduced fruit pastels, and then in the first decades of the 20th century would establish Kit Kats, Aero, Smarties, fruit gums and rollers as household names. Terries of York started in a very similar way to their city rivals, with a successful shop in the centre of York selling gumballs, jellies, and perhaps my favourite, conversation lozenges, um, which were an early form of love hearts. Joseph Terry, who is pictured, um, and his two brothers expanded the business in the early 1850s by leasing a factory on the River Ouse. With its, two, with its location allowing for goods such as cocoa and sugar to be brought in via boat and increasing pro productivity to an industrial scale. The members of both the Terry and Roundtree families were actively involved in philanthropy and took a keen interest in the issues that faced the people of York. Joseph Terry organised parties for the poor, including a dinner for a thousand people on Christmas Day. The Roundtrees as Quakers established a model village, New Earswick, as well as creating in 1881, one of the earliest occupational pension schemes. By 1886, around the time this portrait was painted um, of Sir Joseph Terry, Terry's had become a sole chocolate manufacturer and Joseph was at the helm when the now commonplace chocolate box assortment was invented and named Britannia. Joseph Terry was Lord Mayor on four occasions and was also governor of the Merchant Adventurers. The portrait was painted whilst he was Lord Mayor, likely in his final stint by Irish artist Emily Lawton Barnard. Sir Joseph was well liked among York residents, arranging citywide galas, picnics and church services at York Minster. York City Council wrote that his name appeared at the head of every charitable subscription list and that he was widely recognised as magnificently bearded, which I am sure after having seen this painting, you will agree with as well. The artist Emily Lawton Barnard was born in Cork in Ireland in 1840. Sadly, we don't know much about her, but she was active from the early 1880s until her death in 1911. She worked predominantly in oil and watercolour portraiture, although in my research I did find um, a charming pencil and watercolour depiction of a fairy kingdom, which makes her other works, two of which are York Lord Mayors and um, the other of Thomas Sterry Hunt, an American geologist and chemist, quite staid and sensible in comparison. Her work is important to the whole, as her portrait of Joseph Terry adds to the small number of other works we have by female artists. The coming of the railways transformed York's fortunes. Within a century of the first trains arriving in York, nearly 50% of the city's population were either employed in the confectionery industry or the railways. The first intercity line in the world was built by George Stevenson, um, who was persuaded to build the line through York. And in 1840, the first train ran direct from York to London. Within a decade, there were 13 daily trains between the two cities. In 1877, a new station, then the largest in the country, was built to accommodate the 350,000 passengers traveling through the city annually. In 
In the early 20th century, tourism and yacht boomed as increasing wealth and improvements in transport brought more people to the city, with trains arriving from Manchester, Nottingham and London. In 1966, the government named York as one of five cities to gain special assistance because of their character, beauty and historic interest. A report was written by Lord Escher, president of the Royal Institute of British Architects, to look into York's future. Completed in 1967, the report called for the city centre to be improved and repopulated with historic buildings to be enhanced, but the with the requirement that they be economically self-preserving and that only buildings of the highest standards were to be built within the walled city. The report recognised the danger motor vehicles had on the city's historic fabric and recommended that access be re-restricted through the, the city's historic bars, which are our gateways. In 1968, the entire historic core of York was made a conservation area and Stonegate, which is pictured, became the first of York's foot streets, um, which when cars were banned from it in 1971. The lack of traffic in the city centre alongside its historic architecture provides a unique visitor experience and draws millions of tourists to York every year. This watercolour view of Stonegate on an evening was painted by the landscape artist, writer and illustrator Gordon Cochrane Hearn for his book, The Yorkshire Villes and Worlds, published in 1908. Hearn wrote and illustrated many travel books and explained in this volume that Yorkshire appealed to him on account of picturesqueness or association with historic events and great personages. He then goes on to say that these places can be easily reached from the south with York, just a three or four hour journey from London. Which brings us to our final slide. Um, one of York's most popular and famous visitor sites is one that you may be surprised that I haven't mentioned yet, and that's York Minster. The reason is, is that with over, over 2000 years of history and at least 25 artworks on Art UK, and probably far more out there. It probably deserves its own talk. However, to right or wrong, our final artwork highlights this most iconic of buildings. We do like to think that the Merchant of Ventures comes a close second. Uh, in this gouache on paper by railway artist Fred Taylor, the York Minster looms large over the city with a busy scene depicted below. Likely created sometime between 1925 and 1935, a military parade is crossing over Lendl Bridge, replete with gun carriages and mounted soldiers. There are several rowing boats on the River Ouse passing under the bridge, while several groups of people in fashionable, brightly coloured clothing are making their way in the direction of the Minster. Fred Taylor was a painter and poster designer who was born in London in 1875. He studied in Italy and France, having received a gold medal and travel bursary from Goldsmiths College of Art. He was also the official camouflage artist during World War II, working for the Navy in order to obscure or confuse an enemy's visual observation of a vessel. Before the war, he worked with several railway and shipping firms to create prom promotional posters. We have two such works at the hall, the one that you can see, and the other of one of York's medieval buildings, St. William's College, both of which were produced for London and Northeastern Railways. Created to promote to those tourists arriving by train, it highlights a flourishing York at the height of its powers, coming almost full circle to the York of the 14th century. Thank you all so much for, for, for coming along and I hope that was of interest and uh, obviously do come and visit us. Um, and thank you very much. Have a really good evening, everyone.